Hey guys, Ryan Gaming, Kid Fun Gaming here with a reaction. Today's reaction is for the game series released Five Nights at Freddy's Theory. And I do apologize for the last game series theory I did. Not even theory, it was a reaction to them. Uh, concerning a recent Bendy theory, I did kind of take a little toll on them, kind of got a little mad at them. I am completely sorry to begin with. Before we start this, I'm gonna tap this so we, uh, It's number 16 on trending, um, but let me see if I can find it. Yeah, it's the Bendy Fooled Us. So, <laughs> it was the uh, Bendy versus Bendy, Bendy Fooled Us video. Go check the video out where I reacted to it. I am not trying to get on map half of there. I might just have a little, might just be a little sour apple because I did buy a theory for him, the horse drive clone theory, which, speaking of which, I have more Bendy series, more which is just not one not on the channel yet. So I might just do, at least does as well. Uh, we're gonna pause that before we get to this. I do apologize for um, uh, that's there. I do apologize for all that. Before we get that react reaction started, I fear I go ahead and, uh, tell you I am really sorry about that. Um, uh, so you might go back to that video with now open mind. I may have a little bit of a cold shoulder thanks to that. I didn't know whether or not how I could send that theory to him, either, even for review. And I guess that kind of came over me during that reaction. <sighs> Today's reaction has a offer to do with MadPat, which I'll explain at the very end of the video. Or this reaction, and then we're going to uh, do a Cuphead the musical animated. This is pretty cool. So, I'm going to turn this up a little bit. It looks like a... I think that's a reference to Bendy and the Ink Machine. In Chapter 4, you can crawl through the vents. You'll see somebody doing that almost the exact same thing. Uh, a lost one, actually. Probably the one that speaks. Sorry I'm spoiling Chapter 4 for you guys, but I mean, I'm going to spoil a lot of things because I try to keep up to date with all that. Speaking of which, Chapter 5 achievements are out, so I'm going to go ahead and probably react to those as well. But, this is the theory that changed everything. He does mention a little bit of the, uh... He does mention the Freddy, or not the Freddy files, the security log Hello, button Internet. here. Welcome to... Screw it, you know by now. I, seem a bit off I do apologize for any customers he does say in the video. Not chair. control. Let's talk. Last episode caught you up on everything. And I do mean everything. All my past theories on FNAF 6, the gravestones, the masks, the names of the children inside the animatronics. You want, guys want me to react to that? I will. The puppet, but then I showed you this. The FNAF survival log book. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Seven years of doing this finally broke me. A book <laughs> that contains within its pages an elaborate series of codes that serve as the key to unlocking the identity of Golden Freddy. A freaking children's activity workbook with a damning chica in it. Is Dive police violation. Oh, that damning chica taunts me in my nightmare. The Golden Freddy's unbreakable code is only the tip of the iceberg. This book is like a repeated kick in the balls as Ow. everything I thought I knew about Freddy has crumbled in front of my eyes. It's like Freddy Fazbear got a hold of the Infinity Gauntlet and snapped his fingers and then all of my theories suddenly turned to dust. Because unlike the novels <laughs> which have questionable canonicity, the survival logbook outright answers a lot of our questions about these games. But the answers that it provides just lead to more questions. And not stupid stuff. Small questions either, like what's Mangle's gender? Male. No, it upends huge parts of the story. Uh, just so you know, the custom nights are not canon. So, the girls' night in FNAF 2 is 
where it has Mangle, that's not canon. Mangle is a boy. Same thing with Funtime Foxy. Well, this guy kind of confirmed that because my AIs, but. Here is uh, all the Mangle one for you in this reaction. Foxy. Ever be thrown into this franchise. You see, as I mentioned last time, this workbook once belonged to Mike, aka Michael Afton. The book establishes that Mike writes his answers Same in red pen. It yep. also establishes that there's a spirit possessing the book who speaks Go on, to Mike via lightly faded text. From do you, what I can what gather, do you remember? The do you miss Red. them? And starting with that information, the logbook then proceeds to drop bombshell after bombshell as far as lore reveals go. First, the book outright confirms what we've known for a while now, that Mike is the same Mike who works as the night guard during sister location. And as he's about to prove later in the theory, I had a reason to believe that we play as Mike this section, Mike Lafton, in three games, FNAF 1, FNAF si Sister Location, as shown here, and FNAF Four. But I'll have him explain that. Bonus, we see him doodling in the corners of the page, baskets of money and baskets of exotic butters. On another that. page, he's drawing a smooth set of casual bongos. Sure, it's nothing earth-shattering, but when it comes to this franchise, getting any portion of any theory confirmed is a big win. And while that reveal might not be all that yeah. earth-shattering, you know what is? The book reveals that Michael Afton is who we play as in FNAF 4. On page Told you. 40, the workbook starts asking about dreams. And via his doodles, we see that Mike somehow knows Do you the have of dreams? Nightmare Fredbear, something only the protagonist of FNAF 4 should be aware of. To further... I'm going to uh, bring up another point that he probably doesn't bring up here. Michael Afton could just be haunted by, you know, what he's done. This on page 23 of the book, this is your favorite toy a plastic purple Alcaraz telephone. Was your favorite childhood toy I should have just let him say it. Which, as you may remember, is a direct reference to the purple telephone on the ground in the in NAP NAP 4 bedroom. And if you still think it's a coincidence, it's not. 20 pages later, the spirit starts talking about whether any of the toys on the page look familiar. Most don't, except for one the phone. Now, for the eight of you who still remember how this whole freaking story fits together, you might be asking me, but we all thought the protagonist of FNAF 4 was the crying child, the one who gets himself bitten during the birthday party because you have flashes of a hospital bed and That could also be true, we also and we'll still be playing as Mike here. Nightmare was representative of death, and you know what? You're absolutely right. That is exactly what we've been thinking, and here's the thing. We weren't wrong. We've apparently been you weren't right, right either. It's that. a theory. Except there was one teeny tiny itchy bitsy little wrinkle that we didn't expect. Michael Afton was the bite victim. Not necessarily, but that is a good point to bring up. I didn't think about that. This could be his brother possessing Golden Freddy. Or Golden Freddy's it. it could be his short haired sister for all we know. So that could be there, and Michael's just being haunted by what he's done, which would make some sense. If he lost his frontal lobe, recall that for that four, that child dies. If Michael had managed to survive that, which is very unlikely at this point, able to survive that, you know, that kind of throws you. The crying child. I know! I couldn't believe it either! But the proof here is unquestionable. On page 75, a page asking about him. Oh, uh, Roscoe Wolf did have some of this going without headphones, so I do remember some of this. But, like, not the rest of it. Imaginary friends and featuring the psychic friend Fred Bear Plush, He's here, he's there, he's, he's asks, everywhere. He's he gonna call psych Fred the Fred Bear. damning piece of evidence of all, on page 103, the huge reveal, quote, pa the, the party, party was, was for, for you. you. Mike Afton is confirmed to be the crying child. He's the bite victim. He's the one who, at the end of the game, apparently needed to be put back together. It seems undeniable at this point. But then that leads to the obvious next question. How could he have been bitten and died there, but then also be in sister location as an adult? Gotten himself scooped, blah, 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 until FNAF 6 when he finally burns with the rest of his family. I have been That's smacking really true. my head against a wall trying to make sense of it. All, and I have some theories. 
big surprise there. It's interesting. When I did my final FNAF theory, no, not that one. My final, final FNAF theory. No, not that one either. Those are technically FNAF 6 theories. God, jeez, this one, this one. When I did this theory, I concluded that the story of FNAF was, at its core, a story about a family, the Afton family. But now it's becoming increasingly clear to me that it's really the story of Michael Afton specifically. Four games, one story. Like Scott said back during the FNAF 4 days so long ago, it's the story of the crying child growing up, discovering the atrocities of his father, and then trying to make amends for those. We know for a fact that Michael Afton is the main character of FNAF 1 from the endgame paycheck, sister location from the name tag and custom night. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. FNAF 6 from Henry's closing monologue, and now FNAF 4 from the survival logbook. And we're still not done. The survival logbook also connects Mike to FNAF 2. On page 56, the spirit asks, was your favorite ride the carousel? A question Me. that only makes sense if Mike had been to the FNAF 2 location, because it's the only one with a carousel. Yeah, I bet it was your favorite ride, the carousel. Me and Michael would have had to be a kid, which means FNAF crying child. The still going Freddy, still dead, not Michael. Although, good point. That means that the only game not game mad at him here. To Mike is FNAF 3, but then the point the out whole... different stuff. With a burned down Fazbear Fright in the background, which seems to be hinting at him being the person who burned the place down, trying to put an end to his father's reign of terror. Michael Here, Afton even off. shares a connection yeah. with the dead children whose names appear on the gravestones, going back to the survival logbook. See, I told you guys this thing was important. When the book asks about missing people on account of them being stuffed into animatronic suits, the spirit asks, Do you, Do you miss, miss them? them? It clearly connects Michael Afton to the other missing kids who go on to possess the animatronic suits. This means that Michael is connected to every game and every major character in the story. So let's update it to six games, one story. Michael's story. Which is all very beautiful to say, but seriously, what is that story? If you've been paying attention, we still have a pretty big elephant in the room, i.e. a dead kid who somehow grows up to become an immortal purple skin suit for robot spaghetti. Oh, and if the game wasn't complicated enough, Michael might not even be his real name. The spirit in the logbook repeatedly asks him, what do you remember? And even more importantly, do you, you remember, remember your, your name? name? It's even hidden in the freaking word search, and I haven't even mentioned the other elephants in the room, like how very clearly the gravestones relate to the kids in the animatronic suit. Says Jeremy and, and Fritz. Those names directly tie back to the security guards from FNAF 2. And if you want to go really, yes. really deep, like you know I love to do, you see. So that means Susie and Gabriel are also night guards. Unless those two are somehow tied to FNAF 2. Susie's but. font on her gravestone. Did you know it's the same font that's used to introduce each night of FNAF 4? That's something that no one else online has noticed. And if fonts I did not notice that. Which, remember, they probably are. Scott doesn't do coincidences, so four gravestones with completely different fonts is probably important in some way. Notice how two of the gravestones share the same font, but it's not Jeremy and Fritz, which you would probably expect since they're the two who are mentioned in FNAF 2. There are so many freaking elephants in this room it is a very crowded room <laughs> remember what i said earlier about repeated kicks to the crotch <sighs> this this is what i'm talking about that said after Ow. months of thinking about this and more kicks to the crotch than i care to mention i think i do have an idea of what might be going on here and it all begins in probably the most confusing place this is where my offer is going to come in motorist from fnaf 6 when I first spoke about this minigame, I said that the mustard man here was William Afton. But I could tell that a lot of you weren't too convinced in my conclusion. And I'll be honest, I wasn't 100% sure of it either, but it was the best I could do at the time. But now, Dave is I, also am, William Afton. I am 100% confident that that is who we're seeing here. You see, FNAF 6 is simultaneously the end of the story as well as the beginning. It's the end because, well, everyone burns to death. And it's the beginning because it's the origin story of the puppet. And as we know, everything begins with the puppet. She's the one that allows all the other animatronics to become possessed, as we see in FNAF 2. Which makes the security puppet minigame pretty much the earliest event we ever see in any of these games. And we also know that it's William who killed Charlotte in that back alley. This is the origin story of the purple guy, complete with his purple car that we saw in FNAF 2 after all. But here's the detail I was missing before. What if, if you the, up the final screen of the Midnight Motorist game, game and this game 
and that one game were connected through both happened the same day. It could be raining in two different days. Found that this section of the game in the source files is titled Later That Night, giving us the time connection we needed to know 100% that Orange Guy is William Afton. He kills Charlotte in the rain outside of Fred Bear's, drives away, and winds up back home later that night. Boom! Proven, locked and loaded. And looking at this mini now we just got to tackle the timeline where my offer is going to come in. Couch potato here is his older brother. Mr. Foxy Mask, let me shove my brother into an animatronic mouth and get him killed, speaking in his signature gray text, who apparently no longer has a name, which leaves Michael as the one who escaped to that place again. That is who William is mad at, with that place being obviously none other than Freddy's. And from there, a lot of pieces start to fit together. William's frustration with Michael escaping explains why we see him have surveillance cameras all over his house and sister location. It's not an experiment or anything. He is literally keeping tabs on the boy who keeps running away. It also explains why we see Michael, the crying child, locked in his room throughout FNAF 4. William himself says at the end of Midnight Motorist that Michael will be sorry when he gets back. And he is. As William constantly locks him in his room, making him unable to escape anymore. All of this might even explain the rationale for the nightmare animatronics. William built them, or else used his mind-altering sound disc that first appeared in the book that we talked about in the previous theory, to scare Michael so that he would stop wanting to go to the restaurant in the first place. That's why he's so scared of the place when we see him in FNAF 4. I, I'm literally in the recording closet right now recording this and suddenly suddenly things started to fit together in a weird way. I'm just going to throw this in here right as it happened in my mind. I'll need to look into this later, probably a future theory, but let's just bring it up now. Orange guy is William, right? But he's turned away at the front door of Junior's, which is completely random and everyone's like, why is this in the minigame? Well, could it be because of the investigation into the missing children's incident? Remember what phone guy said from FNAF 2? Yeah. <laughs> Afton is rejected at the front door of the building because of the lockdown and because he's a previous employee. It makes the timeline a bit messy and I'll have to go back and rework it, but something about this feels right. William Afton was fired from his job, goes back to juniors, but the building is under investigation because of the missing children's incident. William, being a former employee, is turned away at the door. He's not allowed in. It's not a bar. It's nothing like that. It's Freddy Fazbear's Junior or something. The second location. The FNAF 2 location. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there because it just occurred to me as I was writing this thing. I haven't had time to fully flesh it out or work it into the script, but I thought it was important enough to include, break the flow of things. Regardless, it gives us something else to chew on. Now back to the actual episode as I wrote it. Okay, I continue to avoid the obvious question here. Michael's death and apparent rebirth. If I'm being honest, it's because I don't really have a explanation for it. It's less of a theory and more of a hypothesis, really. So would you be so kind as to Freddy Faz bear with me? Boo. As I go through what I think might be happening here. We know that Michael Afton is special, right. right? I mean, we see him get scooped, become a pile of rotten flesh, and yet he is still able to survive. In short, when we see him in sister location, he's not altogether human. Now, hold on to that idea for a second for me. While we're on the topic of sister location... Michael's not entirely altogether human. The Got super it. random soap opera from the game with a name that, now that I say it aloud in context, actually starts to make a little bit more sense. That's mentioned by name in the logbook. I just don't remember that. Yay! It stars Vlad, an immortal vampire who's dressed in purple, who starts every episode saying, Clara, I tell you, the baby isn't mine. And in FNAF, we have William Afton, a man who's apparently immortal enough to survive a springlock failure, who, like a vampire, sucks the remnant out of children and who knows, maybe survives on it, and is represented by the color purple. It's actually a lot of similarities. So could the repeated lines of, Not my baby, the baby isn't mine. The baby isn't mine. Actually relate to 
William's relationship with Michael. What if Michael isn't actually William's son? It seems like it would be a logical leap, but we know for a fact that Michael's real name isn't Michael. Remember what the logbook said. Do you remember your name? Well, of course he does logbook. You wrote it on the front cover. Mike. Unless, of course, that's not his real name. So you got all those details. Unless he Good. changed his name. All this random observation there you go. That's what you're together. saying here. In the novels, one of the big overarching storylines is that the main character, Charlotte, Charlotte. had a twin who was kidnapped by Springtrap when she was younger. At the end of the second book, it's revealed that the twin wasn't actually kidnapped. It was her. Which seems to imply that Charlotte and her twin were one and the same. Or were somehow interchangeable. Then, in the final pages, Charlotte dies from a Springlock failure, only to miraculously come back to life unscathed in the next few days as if nothing had ever happened. There are also a lot of clues sprinkled throughout the book that William Afton has the ability to create hyper-realistic humanoid robots. I even mentioned that briefly during a past FNAF theory. I haven't even gotten to how I think the main character of the book series is probably a robot, but again, those are all theories for other days. Long story short, everything seems to point to Charlotte wow. in the books being an AI. Maybe at one point she was a person, but she died or was kidnapped at an early age. And ever since, her personality has been programmed into a computer where she's now able to be replicated over and over again into a super advanced robot that's somehow now able to grow and develop. I didn't write the books, okay? Now, obviously, the two are vastly different canons, but the games and books do relate in a lot hmm. of ways. And we know in the games from William's daughter, Elizabeth, that full-on personalities of individuals can get programmed into AI. Elizabeth goes on to possess the spirit of baby. So what if... We're almost done with this, guys. We're almost Michael done. Michael is just one of those. Sure, he was killed in the bite of 83, but when William promised to put him back together, it meant this is what he meant. put him back together. Find a way to piece him back together using some combination of robotics expertise and miracle soul juice remnant. That's how Michael dies in FNAF 4, but somehow comes back to life in later games. It's how he's able to get scooped, get a bunch of robot spaghetti shoved into him, and then still survive when the robot spaghetti gets puked out of him. It's why he would no longer be able to remember his original name. And after he realizes the truth about what he actually is, that he's no longer human, he decides to end it all in the inferno of FNAF 6 after having done his best to set the souls of his former friends free. Oh boy, that is a lot. And between all these reveals and last week's code, there is a ton for us theorists to start chewing on. But now you get an idea of why I've been beating myself up for months trying to put this whole thing together. It upends mostly everything that we thought we Now we just gotta get chance. one final sure, game theory. Timeline done. I'm not gonna focus on the game the uh, events. Events anyway, for the, the game, the like trilogy, the, the puppet stuff. Stuff simple I'm gonna keep in here. Already, just to blind to it so as when to games in the timeline happen. Even more exciting, Scott is releasing Ultimate Custom Night soon. So between those two, I am certain that there'll be more clues on the way, helping us to come to a final conclusion to all of this. We put you back together. We'll take you apart all over again. So until then, remember, it's all just a theory. A game! Theory with some game hypothesis thrown in there for good measure. Thanks for watching. By the way, if you like, all right. So while he's doing this, try to do some subscribe type of things. I'm going to reveal my offer. I had got you guys with the suspense of it for way too long. Matt, Pat. All right. Here's my offer. I will help you put together a timeline, a timeline for your channel. Then again, you can also decline this offer, but that's a whole other story here. What you're doing, you're going to come up with the rest of it. I'm going to keep most of your timeline the same. I'm going to move sister location to a more reasonable spot, right up along, running alongside FNAF 3. But, because think about it. Would you, if the place where you have sister location now, with these robots, spend 30, 40, even 50 years getting parts to go and kill children, what they're programmed to do. Would they? Think about that. Alright? So we're moving sister location way up towards where FNAF 3 is, 
two games running alongside each other. Now, for if we change this on your timeline, I'm going to help you out. Alright? So, this means Michael cannot be in FNAF 3, but it's one of those two other names. As Fritz and Jeremy are FNAF 2 Night Guards, the other two, Gabriel and Susie, have to be other Night Guards in the series. FNAF 3 and FNAF 6. Now, Michael could also be in FNAF 6, but I'm staying away from that. I've got a bunch of Bendy theories to unveil, which are better than the one I currently have on my channel now, or the part of it. Anyway, so I'm going to move this location down. I'm going to add FNAF 6 into the mix and present it. Whether you accept it or reject it, that's up to you. And that will be your final quote unquote timeline. Unless you decide to polish what I have one final time. I am not going to do my finishes. I'm only going to move one thing, just location, and then add the next six. All I'm going to do. So, what this means is that everything else in your timeline is untouched. You can change that if you want to. You can change where F4 is. You can change that if you want. This location I am changing, and I'm adding F6 into the timeline. Got it? I'm talking to you about the events. Like, Monday, Tuesday, you know, the actual pizzeria, similar things, not the other stuff. Those mini games there that help grab, bring up all the lore, those will be added where they will need to in the actual timeline itself. So, what do you say to that offer? Accept or reject? And please react to this on GTA Live. I will love to hear your reaction to that. Alright. And uh, while you're at it, do try not to cringe on the Benny theory that's currently on my channel as of recording this. The first ever video on the channel is Boris has survived clone. Which, at this point, might as well just be confirmed. Because that theory... That Borsa was there is pretty much a survived clone. I just figured I'd bring up the fact that nobody started asking that. Which would also probably explain why Alice, aka Susie, Chapter 3, wants that Borsa badly. You know, because it's a survived clone, it escaped out of her reach. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, I'm not even going to finish the rest of that theory. I'm going to jump straight into new theories that sound a little bit more legit and make a little bit more sense. <sighs> so that was my offer. Make a time, I'll make a timeline for you. You put it on there and you polish it off. I'll release it here on my channel. You look at it. You go over on your channel and polish it off if need be. Then I will add my timeline where I add more fixes. Seems perfectly simple. So I hope you guys did enjoy this video. I hope MatPat enjoys that little offer I made him. And I will see you guys in the next video. Or reaction or whatever. This video is way too long. We need to get a move on. Hope you guys did enjoy this video. And have I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. And if not, I hope this did it increase your day. Now, I was not getting map, map pad at all. I was just pointing out things. That Now, I believe the Bendy theory I reacted to, I think I was getting a little too mad. You know, the fact that, you know, I tried to send this map pad. I couldn't figure out how to. So, I, I probably got, got that anger out in that video. <sighs> so, without rambling on anymore, Hope you guys did enjoy this video. I will see you guys in the next reaction or actual video that I do. And hope my pad takes off the offer. And I might make a video directed at Scott later. But there's a whole other story. And I have still have to plan that part out. So, see you guys in the next video. Have a fantastic day.